Welcome, I'm Cheryl Dowd, Senior Director for Policy Innovations for the State Authorization Network, SAN, part of WCET. We're pleased to present the 2021 SAN Stational Award-winning projects. Today, we will introduce the great work of our colleagues from Slippery Rock University. The SAN Stational Award is an annual award originally conceived in 2015 to recognize the outstanding work of SAN members to develop solutions and strategies to manage state and federal regulations for out-of-state activity compliance that serves to provide student protections. As one can understand, establishing processes and procedures to support compliance isn't a one-size-fits-all task. Creativity and vision are important attributes for compliance staff to understand the problem, conceptualize tools or procedures to address the problem, and then obtain buy-in at the institution for cross-institutional collaboration to implement processes and procedures to support compliance. Awards are determined through a process that includes self-nomination of projects to a review committee who evaluates and identifies the projects that should be awarded. The listing of award winners and descriptions of previous projects from previous years is provided on the SAN website for your review. We'd like to thank the, the uh, awards committee for their good work and support throughout this process. And at this time, I'd like to turn my turn this to my colleague, Rachel Stokowiak, Director for Interstate Policy and Compliance. Thanks, Cheryl. Today, we are thrilled to award the Rock University in the category of Compliance Innovation for the 2021 Sensational Awards. Uh, Lisa Marie Weinzel, uh, who is the State Authorization Specialist at Slippery Rock University, um, understood the need uh, to conceptualize and streamline um, a daunting task of collecting uh, hundreds of student experiential learning activity uh, data information from dozens of professors across campus. Um, as we've discussed in the previous 2021 uh, Sensational Board project presentations, um, we know that states uh, maintain authority to oversee activities which occur within their borders, and that's really a function to protect the interests and well-being of their citizens. Um, and this oversight uh, includes and extends to education. Um, so since that state oversight extends to uh, education um, and really the traditional state authorization approval, which is the authority to grant degrees and operate as a business, as an institution, um, that that's sort of the the bedrock and where we start additionally there are other approvals that may exist um, and for example uh, in order to train and conduct educational experiences um, for programs leading to a professional license for example so depending on the type of activity there could be a state approval of a particular regulatory body within that uh, that state um, required uh, uh, as part of sort of the institution's ability to operate or offer a program to a student in that location. Thus, knowing the location of the educational activities really serves as critical information um, for understanding applicable rules in a state, um, especially if an institution is offering online programs or experiential learning um, to students located outside of the primary state of domicile uh, for that institution. Um, Slippery Rock is one of many institutions who benefit from participation in a reciprocal agreement um, that's called the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements. Um, this helps to streamline the process to maintain state approvals for purposes of distance education. Um, one requirement for continued institutional participation in this um, is fulfilling an annual data reporting um, function or requirement. Um, and this calls on institutions to provide data about the location uh, and the classification of their academic program, often called a SIP code, um, to the nonprofit entity uh, that's called NCSERA, who supports the functions of that state authorization reciprocity agreement. Um, so to fulfill this data requirement, um, you know, and other reporting requirements, um, and ultimately to make compliance um, with state authorization procedures as smooth as possible at any institution, it really takes a village. It calls upon many stakeholders at the institution to share information and, and work together to create systems which work for that unique institution. Lisa tapped into key members at her institution to share information and conceive of a really smart and cost-effective uh, system to help manage uh, compliance with this reporting requirement and ultimately to better support compliance uh, with state oversight. So with that, Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about how you brought order to chaos at Slippery Rock. Thank you very much, Rachel. On behalf of Slippery Rock University, we're very excited to accept this board. And on behalf of the team that created the process, I am very excited to present 
our process to you. Um, I want to start with this word cloud that is actually created using all the words that were pulled from our placements last semester. We do about 4,000 placements a year. And so this is just from uh, fall semester from last year. Slippery Rock University was founded in 1889 and it's a member of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. We're located one hour north of Pittsburgh and have an enrollment of over 8,400 8, students with 6,900 of them being undergrads and 1,500 graduate students. So we deal with both uh, clinical rotations as well as regular internships for undergrads. We have 150 plus undergraduate majors and 40 graduate degrees and certificates. Our challenge was how do we get quality information and timely information on the experiences that we do while minimizing the time that was involved on behalf of faculty. Faculty have a lot to do and giving them administrative tasks is not one of their favorite things to do. So how could we make that better for them? Our initial effort, and this is a version from 2019, was a spreadsheet that was sent to everybody. And they had to fill out the information and then they would send it back to us. And then we would cross check it with class rosters and it became time consuming on both parts. And then you added this CIP code and people were like, where do I find that? How do I know that? And it became confusing. So we were starting to look at things and then COVID struck. And what we found out was that we could use our resources in-house and come up with a system that was easy for everybody involved and allowed us to get quality information, limited the amount of time that faculty had to put in, and we could also use it for other things. So right, what you see here now is actually the spreadsheet from this summer, excuse me, from this winter session for one of our faculty members. This is what gets sent out. The uh, redacted areas are names, but you can see it lists their program, what college they're in, are they an undergraduate graduate, a section number, and then we ask, is it required the name of the site, the city, state, we provide the CIP code based on what's in Banner. And then because we are dealing with remote on-site situations, we ask questions about that. So with this form, faculty and staff, excuse me, faculty only need to provide a site, a city, a state, and if it's remote or not remote. And how we did it, it was a total team effort. At the time that I was working on this, I was part of the institutional research group. So we really tapped into them, Dean Lindy, uh, worked with me on the initial spreadsheet. He's since retired. And then Kevin McCarthy came in and he worked with the new spreadsheet and make sure that he updated it and then make sure that we're pulling the correct information. And then Julie Cogley, who's also part of that team and is a friend of mine, um, who is very determined when it comes to learning new things and has mad computer skills. She's the one that actually found the macro that we used. She taught herself how to use it. And then she taught me how to use it. And she created the directions that you're gonna see throughout this presentation. So when you do this, you need two reports. You need the report that has all the student information, and then you need the, student, the report that is used for mail merge. And this again, we'll go into this a little more later on, but the blue area is something that you need to manually add from the report. So with the first one, the faculty Excel workbook, when you run this report, we get a workbook that has as many faculty members supervising uh, internships, clinicals, anything like that, that falls into, we call them experiential learning activities. We'll have a tab. So you see like one through eight, that's everybody's tab down there for each professor that's in this workbook. So what we need to do is divide this one workbook into individual ones without running individual reports. Um, a tip here is if you are gonna print them out, we have moved beyond printing them out and collecting them as a printed piece of paper. Um, you wanna format them all here and it's really easy to format all your spreadsheets at the same time. So once you get this, then you're going to wanna open one of the spreadsheets in there and you're gonna hit Alt F11. And that's gonna bring up this, it's called a VBA and it's a Microsoft Visual Basic application. And you'll get this gray out, grayed out box in there. The next thing that you'll wanna do is you're gonna add this formula into that gray box. And this is what it looks like. And then you're gonna press F5. And what you'll see doing there is it will sort of spin through everything. You can actually like see it cycling through dividing everything. 
So when you after you hit the F5, everything will be divided into individual files in one folder. You want to make sure that there's nothing else in that folder because it'll become confusing when you're trying to do the mail merge. I go back and add everything in after I complete the mail merge and hit send and everything goes out. Um, as you can see, everything here is named after what was on the tab. So this will tie in back to the mail merge and this will be the actual attachments to the mail merge. The second spreadsheet you need is the merge spreadsheet. And as we talked about, that blue column needs to be added manually. Everything else is pre-populated. For our purposes, I pulled out faculty names and IDs, but you can see what the chart looks like and um, when we add that final merge path column. To add a merge math merge path column, I just go now by just call it the merge column, but you want to make sure you do it exactly as it's listed here. You want to make sure you have the equals and the quote marks and all the ampersigns and everything. And the way it's broken out is the yellow highlighted area is going to be the actual file location. Blue will be the column in the spreadsheet that we were just on that has an ID number that you're going to match up. And then the XLS, PDF, XLXS, whatever is the document that you're using right there. And then you just hit enter. And if you're used to using Excel spreadsheets and copying cells down, you just do the same thing. You know, you copy, hit the little corner and pull it all down. And then once you get all that, make sure you save everything. And then you're just sort of going to put this aside until you're ready to actually do the mail merge. So to do the merge, this is where you actually create your document that's going to go. And when I do it, I, you know, sort of put a picture and explain to everything. This is what you need to do here. You need to do this. You need to do that. I also always put a date so that we get it back in time. Uh, right now we sent out everything was due on Friday, last Friday for winter session, and I probably have half that aren't. So when I'm done here, we'll be reaching out to those folks and saying we need this information um, because otherwise it'll be February when I'm getting spring semester information and getting this information. Um, also at this time when I do it, when this, and this is rec, really the uh, mail merge wizard type of thing, it walks you through everything. When we get to recipients, what I typically do is to test it out is I um, change a couple of the email addresses to my addresses or friends addresses, just so that we can run it and make sure it's good. The one thing you wanna do is make sure you uncheck everybody else so they don't get it in your test run and then make sure when you're done to put their addresses back in for the people that you um, tested on. So then you're going to want to add the attachments and these are screenshots from my, uh, my computer and my ribbons. So you see there's a merge tool one and then when you click on merge tool, you click on merge with attachments. Now you're probably saying, but I don't have merge tools on my ribbon. So we actually found this, Julie, found this online. Um, there's several other ones. We use Doug Robbins, but there's a multitude that you can pick. And this is the process for setting it up and getting it on your computer. Um, we did this once and I never have to do this again. So it makes it real easy to use. So after you've done all your merge and you hit continue, you've picked your recipients and everything, this is gonna pop up. And what you wanna do is on number one, you're gonna pick from that line that lists everything, merge path, because that's what we're merging based on. Number two, you wanna have email message as our merge destination field. Number three, you wanna pick and select email. And number four, you wanna put the subject of what it is. And then you're gonna hit continue. And what happens is you'll see it spinning through and you may, have to, depending on your security systems and firewalls, have to quote unquote approve or okay each one. It's not a process, a little pop-up message hits and you just click it and it takes a couple seconds. Sometimes it'll say, do you wanna be okay for one to three minutes and anything processed through there, we'll go through there. And then you just sort of sit and it's like, I liken it to the top of the roller coaster when you're up at the top and then you're waiting and you hit send and you hope it goes through and then you start seeing everything come in send and you're like okay and then i test a couple to make sure that it truly did go to everybody that it was meant to go to so now you send everything out and hopefully people are sending it back to you within the deadlines and then you get all this information back so what do you do with it for your sarah data reporting so what we do is we collect everything and put it in 
uh, save it electronically. I save everybody by their last name because it's, I know their last names where I don't know people's banner ID numbers. So if I need to go back and ask questions, it's much easier this way. Um, save the files individually, and then we save them also on one master spreadsheet. So this is actually stuff from fall semester that I just picked that shows everything here. We do it um, for the whole academic year. And then when it comes time for data reporting, I go and I pull it based on calendar year. We go through, create one big spreadsheet that has everything. Um, I pull out Pennsylvania schools because we're located in Pennsylvania for our reporting. And then um, my friends at IR set me up with a pivot table. So we actually just use this pivot table and this is the breakout of what you need. You need the state and the CIP codes and the values that count and you hit and does this little thing and then you get this. So right there is everything that I need to go and do the CERA data reporting. I know that there's one student in this year that was a 31 in Arizona, four that were 51 and one that was 52. And then I just go and enter that on my form, um, pull out the numbers from iPads for the distance learners for that form and my reporting is done. Bravo, Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing about this project and congratulations to you, Slippery Rock uh, and your colleagues, um, uh, Julie and, and Kevin for all their good work. This is such a helpful project and, and I know it'll um, uh, provide a great example for other institutions uh, looking to streamline their processes and, and gather information more effectively uh, with so many different uh, constituents on their campus. Um, participating in these sort of processes. So thank you, congratulations again. I wanna remind folks that you can go online and view the um, uh, additional 2021 Sensational Award-winning projects uh, on our website listed here on this slide. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you.